Now let's do screen share. Work, work. I'm always kind of really happy it works. Okay. So, um, talking about the photon, and then we're going to um, extend the discussion to Klein Gordon and to Proca equations. Photon. Klein Gordon. Equations. Uh, okay, so last time uh, we did the uh, classical description of the photon, and we ended up with an equation that involves the um, uh, four vector potential, a mu phi a. It is a four vector. And I argued that uh, we can choose several gauges. So we ended up with an equation, which looks like that. D'Alembertian of A nu minus D nu A mu, D mu A mu equal to J nu. That is a combination of Maxwell's equations. And then this is still subject to a gauge transformation. So we have several choices of gauges. And we chose the Lorentz condition. All right, so a gauge transformation means that we can a, a change a, a mu into another a prime mu, which is a mu plus the um, gradient of a scalar function. And the Lorentz condition means that the scalar function lambda is chosen such that the D'Alembertian of A nu equal to J nu. And D'Alembertian, what is that? Oops. Dalembertian. Dalembertian, one over C squared, uh, dt squared minus Laplacian. Um, right, this is almost a Dalembertian. Dalembertian. It's a Minkowski space uh, equivalent um, to the Laplacian in three dimensions. Uh, and in vacuum, what? Uh, I think as before that the case presses your lock button. Something. In the case of the iPad. Or something physical. Um, something, something. Okay, I'll try not to <laughs> touch too many things here. So in vacuum, that leads us to the D'Alembertian of A nu equal to zero. That is a classical equation. So far everything we did is classical, but this is a wave equation for light. Wave equation at speed, the phase velocity. Uh, C, one, which is C. Um, so, close, Siri. Okay, I'm not touching anything. Right, this was, uh, everything here was classical. Then we said, okay, let's make a quantum mechanical interpretation. And the, and the way to do a quantum mechanical interpretation is to promote the energy and momentum into operators that operate on some wave function, right? And that's the simplest way. 
Something better. Is that somebody? Hello. And I've got no clue what's going on here. Hopefully it's not some uh, Chinese intelligence that's run over my, uh, my iPad right now. Or somebody else's intelligence. Um, okay, so we said that uh, this is the way we derive the Schrodinger's equation. And so we can do the same trick for photons and uh, using the fact that E squared minus P squared is equal to zero for photons. That's equivalent to P mu, P mu equal to zero. So if I promote this to operators, then P mu, P mu promoted to minus the D'Alembertian. And that means that quantum mechanical interpretation Um, to uh, the equation that the number of of a is equal to zero is that the four potential is that a mu or a nu uh, is interpreted as the wave function of a photon. So the classical equation now becomes a, a quantum equation which describes the kinematic of a massless particle, p mu, p mu equal to zero. And I said that this is kind of, uh, and, and this is in vacuum. And when we have um, not vacuum, so the D'Alembertian of a nu is equal to j nu, then this is interpreted as the existence of currents um, produce or cause annihilation of photons. So this equation, n of a nu equal to j nu, is interpreted as um, you know, photon can be decomposed into currents. Now, a mu we said is a vector, and then we search for plane wave solutions. Right. And we wrote down at a mu as a epsilon mu of p, p minus i, p nu, x nu. Right, this is the polarization vector. And then we simply use the solution inside the equation we have, um, the Lambertian of a nu equal to zero, give us that, um, sorry, not even that, the Lorentz condition. This is a solution. Okay, this is a, uh, is a solution of this equation. And then the Lorentz condition P mu a nu equal to zero translates into P mu epsilon mu equal to zero. Uh, and I said that even after that, I still have, we still have a still extra degrees of freedom because there are several choices of lambda that can still fulfill the Lorentz condition. And then we can still, we still have an extra degree of freedom in the way you can choose lambda. And we choose it in such a way, right, that uh, 
lambda if x is i b e minus i p nu x nu such that b is equal to minus epsilon zero over p zero this is known as the Coulomb gouge or transverse gouge which means that the Lorentz condition becomes p vector dot epsilon vector equal to zero. Uh, and in words, that means that the polarization of the photon is transverse to its direction of motion. We know that. We'll just prove it now. Um, and that means that there are only two polarization states, right, of a photon. So there are only two degrees of freedom. For a new, which means there are two polarization states. And the last thing we did was simply write them down. So, you know, without loss of generality, if we said that the photon moves, travels in the Z direction, so photon P gamma is uh, P gamma in the Z direction, right? Then we said that we can write them down, you know, epsilon one could be zero, one, zero, zero. So in the X direction, remember zero X, Y, Z, time X, Y, Z, and epsilon two mu just zero zero one zero but of course this is not unique we could choose circularly polarized states these are of course linear polarization linearly polarized states we can also have circularly polarized states So mu minus one over square root of two zero one i minus i sorry zero and epsilon plus mu is minus one over square root of two for normalization zero one i zero and I'm going to show you now that these states really correspond to the z component of the spin of the photon being as z is plus minus one and the z component of the photon spin. Right, this is pretty much, I think, what we just uh, had time to go through on Tuesday. So before I proceed to the next uh, step to show you what is the, to discuss the photon spin, um, I'm stopping and asking you if you have any questions. Any questions, anybody? No? Anybody? Does that mean that everything is clear? How do you write the, how do you write the photo spin operators? Just like angular momentum operators? Essentially, yes. Well, let's discuss them right now. Okay. Uh, by the way, did you learn about generators of rotations or generators in general? Who learned about generators? Raise your hand. 
two, three. Okay, well, okay. Let's speak about now the photon spin. So we said that the general solution of a photon that propagates in the z direction, right? So p perpendicular to z direction. Uh, we have a sum, right, of the form a mu, the a b1 epsilon 1 mu plus b2 epsilon 2 mu e minus i p nu um, x nu plus the complex conjugate, right? Um, because the photon is real. So there's no point in looking at um, at uh, complex, um, you know, uh, something that describes a field that is not real. Uh, so that means that I can write, right, simply looking at the real part of that, because again, the, the, the field that describes the photon is a real field. Photon is a real particle, right? So A mu is a real of A, B1 epsilon 1 mu plus B2 epsilon 2 mu. Now I'm going to simply write it down. Uh, 2 mu E plus I P mu X mu. Uh, writing the plus rather than the minus is basically means that I'm taking the real part of the complex conjugate and not the real part of the original of plane wave solution. Uh, it's because I don't want to avoid confusion in, uh, in the definitions to come shortly. Of course, mathematically, it doesn't matter which real part I take, the original one or the complex conjugate. Okay, so this is just my choice, um, which slightly confuse you here because in order to confuse you less uh, down the line and really to not to confuse myself because there is a plus minus signs that I got uh, confused one evening when I, when I prepared that. Uh, okay, so there are two, we can look at specific cases, right? So specific cases. So case number one would be that B1 is equal to zero or B2 is equal to zero, right? What does that describe? What does that describe? B1 or B2 are equal to zero. What happens if I put here B1 equal to zero? What, what am I describing? I swear to you, I, I, a minute ago I asked you if you have any questions. There was one, but not really related to that. For me, if I asked you there, there are questions and there are nobody asked, that means that everything is clear. If I say B2 is equal to zero, but this I wrote it down, right, it's written down here. Now I say B2 is equal to zero. What am I describing exactly here? That you're in a completely polarized state for B1 for that. Thank you, thank you. And what, what is B1, which direction is that? Oh, I no, no up. The photon, remember, what direction the photon, the, the photon propagates? Z? Z, right? It's actually right in here. P perpendicular to the Z direction. P photon, the, the momentum of the photon is in the Z direction. So watch which direction is that polarization? It's perpendicular, either x or y. Yeah, which one? Uh, x. X, right? Y. All right, I actually wrote down the four reps on here. What are the four components? T, x, y, z. Right? So epsilon one is a polarization vector in the x direction. 
Very good. Is that clear to everybody? So if I say B2 is equal to zero, that means that I'm only left with the B1, the real part of B1. I'm describing a photon that propagates in the Z direction and the polarization is in the X, X direction. Yeah. Right. If it's uh, B, B1 is equal to zero, where is the polarization direction of the photon now? Y. Y, right? So it goes like that. Propagating here, goes like that. But I also have this uh, circularly polarized, right? So I can choose, this is a specific example, right? I can choose another example, right? B1 epsilon one mu plus B2 epsilon two mu. I can write him as epsilon up, right? The zero one minus I zero or epsilon down which is zero, one plus I, zero. So what do we have here? The 90 degrees difference, right, between the two components. So that means that the dependence of um, X nu, right, the dependence on X nu will be of the form, right, up to some phase constant, right? A, let's call it up, right? It's proportional. Forget about the time and the Z components. Okay, just the X and Y components. Time X, Y, Z, right? Time X, Y, Z. I forget about that, right? Just the X and Y, just the X and Y. Just focus on these two, right? So it will be the real part. I have here a one multiplying by E, I, P, nu, X, nu. It's the real part of E I P nu X nu. And here it's gonna be the real part of minus I multiplied E I P nu X nu. Right? The X and Y component, right? You understand where it comes from? Okay, at least two says yes. So what is the real part of E I P X? What is the real part of E to the power I something? Cosine? Cosine, thank you, very good. So this, this is just the cosine of P nu X nu. And what is the real part of minus I times that? Sign. Sign. Thank you. And what for the down arrow? So A down proportional. Again, we have a real part. We have a one here. So it's an E I P nu X nu and a real of plus I E I P nu X nu. So for the first part, we have a cosine. What do we have for the lower part? Minus sign. Minus sign.
So let's say we have a photon. So a photon and the photon propagates in the Z direction. Right, so I did switch. Right, so without loss of generality, right? So um, which direction is the vector A? Let's say A with an up arrow. Which plane is it gonna be? And the xy thing. The xy, right? So a would be in that line, right? So let's say the vector a. A up arrow. Let's say it's a tan t equal to zero. Right? Now what's going to happen is a function of time to the vector a. It will spin. It will rotate, right? It will rotate in the xy plane uh, from the x to y, so it will rotate like that, right? So after some time, it will go like that, right? That's called right-handed circular polarization. Right? Because if you put the thumb in the Z direction, it rotates as the right hand, right? Like a helix. And what about A with a down arrow? What does it represent? Left-handed support. Right, right. It's a left-handed, right? It will rotate in the, in the opposite direction. So the A will rotate in the opposite direction. It's the left-handed. Which is, by the way, what the electric field vector is doing, right? E is minus dt of a. That's the way the electric field rotates. Um, so, you know, these arrows really represent the polarization, the, the arrow and the polarization is very name, they represent the direction of rotation, right, relative to the direction of motion. Now the direction, the direction of rotation relative to the direction of motion has a name. This is called the helicity. Let me show it to you. We're going to speak about it in a second. So, um, uh, direction of rotation relative to the direction of motion. is called felicity. Well, it's a technical name. Now let's see what it means, helicity. So helicity and spin. Um, Okay, so I'm going to uh, relate the helicity states to the spin of the photon. How? I'm going to start by looking at the two polarization states. So the two polarization states. Right, so we have um, 
just that x y component. Epsilon up, one minus i, and epsilon down is one plus i. Right. I'm going to argue that these states have a well-defined angular momentum in the z direction. Um, so in order to do that, I need to find the representation of the angular momentum operator. Um, do you understand what I'm saying? Or uh, do my words start to sound gibberish to some of you? Okay, so they, we start by setting a basis. So we have the use the in Cartesian basis. Cartesian basis, right? So epsilon one is one zero and epsilon two is just zero one, right? This is going to be the basis that we're gonna use for the vector space that contains the epsilon up and epsilon down, right? How do we describe a rotation in a small angle? Right, delta theta or delta phi, right? In the positive direction, right? In the positive direction. Right, along the z-axis. Um, how do I represent it? How do I represent the rotation? I actually did that in this course. One delta phi minus delta phi one. If you want to say matrix, yeah, you're right. I just want to ah, say okay. yes. matrix. Right, and the matrix is going to be, of course, cosine delta phi, and then minus sine delta phi, sine delta phi, cosine delta phi. These are just x, y, right? Everything else is the z and t is just the ones, the diagonal and zeros everywhere else, right? So very small, for very small delta phi, right? This is going to be one minus delta phi, delta phi, and one, right, for delta phi. It's more than one. So I can write this. This is equal to one plus I delta phi JZ, right? And JZ is the operator that represents the Z component of the angular momentum. Right? Right. Now, how do we call an operator that represents um, infinitesimal transformation or infinitesimal rotation in this case? Generator? Yeah, this is the generator. Right? This is known as the generator of the rotations. Now, for my knowledge, a few of you said that you've already encountered generators. Which course did you know see that? For the group theory. 
group theory. Yeah. Is it, uh, I guess it's not obligatory for uh, physics, or is it? No, it wasn't at Barilan either. So not in Barilan, yeah. And the other ones who saw that? In Barilan, but not in, but in the mathematics course. The mathematics, okay. Yeah, maybe, okay, I need to see how to organize the rest of the semester. Maybe I should have a lecture or two about generators and operators of that kind. Um, very crudely speaking, for those of you who have not seen that, right? Uh, in physics, conservation laws are associated with uh, symmetries, right? We, we want to find symmetries because of Netter's theorem that says that every symmetry that we can find, uh, there is something that is being conserved. And with physics, in, in physics, we love conservations, right? Conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, conservation of angular momentum. They are all associated with symmetries, right? Uh, uh, symmetry basically means that we are changing something, but nothing happens to the system, right? Uh, the system we said is invariant, right? Um, now we can think, and I'm going to do it, actually, I'm going to have a full tutorial next week about that. There are discrete symmetries, so I'm inverting something, like I'm inverting time. That's a symmetry or not. Or, and there is continuous symmetry. My right? rotation is a continuous symmetry because I can rotate in any infinitesimal uh, angle that I want. I can reverse in time and that's called uh, time change or I can reverse in space, that's called parity. This, I can do it once, I cannot, I cannot do it continuous. But as far as um, rotations, for example, this is a continuous symmetry, right? Uh, now I can write down a continuous symmetry as an operator on the system. It's a unitary operator. And this unitary operator is going to be infinitesimally close to the identity. So basically, I'm going to write down psi uh, goes to psi prime, so the symmetry be written as psi is equal to psi there, which is u, unitary operator, times psi, and where u of epsilon, right, is just the identity, plus some small correction, i epsilon g. Right, g is the parameter, and uh, epsilon is a small parameter, and g is, is known as the generator of the transformation. major part of group theory, which again, I'm, it's kind of an overview course on what people do in particle physics. So that's what we have here. So JZ is the generator of rotations in the Z direction. So in this epsilon one, epsilon two basis, which I just chose epsilon one and epsilon two, Right, if I write it down as i1 plus delta phi jz, that means that jz in epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 basis, then jz is just 0 i minus i and 0. That's the way it's represented. Now I can take this JZ and apply it to the two vectors I have, epsilon up arrow and epsilon down arrow. Here they are. All right, so if I write down JZ, epsilon up, right, just zero I minus I zero times one minus I, what do we get? one and minus i, so just epsilon up. And if I take jz and apply it to epsilon down, right, minus one, minus i, just minus epsilon down.
So what I just did here, I just showed you that epsilon up and epsilon down are eigenvectors of Jz with the eigenvalues plus and minus one. All right, so epsilon up, epsilon down are eigenvectors of Jz with eigenvalues plus one or minus one. So they have angular momentum of plus or minus one in the z direction, right? Now, right, when we speak about uh, rotation, right, I didn't say anything about the spatial wave function, right, that represents the photon, right? This is only about the internal degrees of freedom of the photon, right? So I rotated it in its internal degrees of freedom. Now, how could we, how do we call the internal rotation degrees of freedom? We call them spin. Call them spin, right? So we deduce that these eigenvectors and eigenvalues, right, are eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the spin operators. And since we only look at internal and degrees of freedom, when we conclude that uh, epsilon up and epsilon down are eigenvectors. Uh, uh, with eigenvalues plus minus one of the spin operator. I, I didn't say anything about the di direction of motion of the photon in space, so I don't know about the uh, total angular momentum. Uh, now we chose the photon to be moving in the z direction. This was our choice, right? It didn't lose any, there's no loss of generality here, of course. Uh, but that means that we can define the helicity. The helicity, the definition of the helicity is the normal component um, of the spin along the duration of motion, right? The normalized component of the spin along uh, the direction of motion. The helicity age, right, is just the spin, this is definition. It is spin multiplied by the momentum vector normalized. The projection of the spin onto the direction of the angle of the momentum. What's the helicity here? What's the helicity of the photon?
Well, we said that the fun is moving in the z direction, and we chose the the generator to be of that of the rotation in the z direction. So I really already took the dot product here. So what is it? What are the eigenvalues of the spin? Well, what's the quietness, guys? Plus minus one. Plus minus one, right? In which direction? It's a scalar. Yeah, hey, okay. First is color. <laughs> the eigenvalues of the spin, which I measured in the z direction. No, age is color. That's that's what I'm trying to say. Right, the spin is color. Of course, it's color, right? The, I mean, the dot product is already here. Right, because the P is in the Z direction and JZ is in the Z direction. So the dot uh, product is going to give me one anyway. So I just add it up with a plus minus one. That's all. Okay. At this point, I can tell you that I'm happy with the fact that you're so quiet because that doesn't mean too, too good things, too many good things. What did I do here, right? So uh, I, I did this few mathematical tricks, which could be quite confusing if this is the first time you see them. And definitely if you're not familiar to work with this uh, type of thing. I basically showed you that the photon has a spin one, right? It's not one half, it's not an arbitrary choice. Right? Um, I mean, we normalize J in a different way, but then um, we'll have to change the definition of the generator, right? Because you, I just wrote it down here. It's i plus i epsilon g, right? So it's i times delta phi. You can do epsilon here is delta phi, right? Uh, pick up uh, g, g is j z, right? But this is delta phi and this is j z, right? The fact that I get it, um, uh, now, Jz generates a rotation in a delta phi, right? That would give me the spin one. If I want to have a, a spin one half, I would say, okay, this is delta phi over two. Right? But I couldn't, I couldn't really uh, trick it because um, if I multiply by two delta Jz, then it would generate a delta phi over two. So I cannot avoid concluding that the spin of the photon is exactly one, not any other number. Um, about the directions, right? I chose this, uh, I chose the real part of the complex conjugate, right? I could have done it for the original one with the E with the minuses, and I would get confused with the right and left handed. Um, uh, I would just end up that the epsilon it's an up arrow is a left handed and epsilon with a down arrow is a right handed. So I just don't want to get confused too much and be consistent with what's written in the literature. Uh, I do have to say that in some textbooks, you can find that epsilon up is defined with a, a negative helicity rather than a positive helicity. Um, it's a, the convention, right? I'm using the, the standard convention that you see in, in most textbooks that I read, and I read four of them. All right, questions? No, okay, then let me, if not, then I'm going to confuse you slightly some more. If you're onto that, then let, let's proceed. Uh, parity. Uh, so a parity uh, is a flip of sign of the spatial coordinates. Parity operator or parity transformation. This is a discrete symmetry. It is a flip of sign of the 
spatial coordinate. Right, so R goes to minus R. Miro, basically. R goes to minus R. Uh, again, um, all symmetries in physics are crucial. In particle physics are extra crucial. Uh, it, in, in quantum electrodynamics and quantum chromodynamics, uh, the interactions always conserve parity. This is one of the fundamental concern laws, which can determine why some, some interactions or some decays are allowed and some others are not allowed. Right? Parity is conserved. And for many years, it was thought that it's, it's a fundamental um, uh, symmetry of nature until in the 1950s, uh, 54, 56, two guys, Li and Yang, you might know the names, right? Two Chinese uh, physicists, uh, Tsung Dao Li and Shen Ning Yang. Shen Ning is a, is a party, is a female. Uh, they show that party is not conserved in a weak interaction. It was enough to grant them a Nobel Prize. Okay, so party. Conserved in electromagnetic and strong interaction. But Lee and Young showed it is not conserved in weak interactions. So basically what happens when you do a parity, right? Mark, think of it as a mirror. You put things in a mirror. What happens to a vector? Regular vector, three vector. What happens to the vector? Changes direction, the opposite direction. It changes sign, mm -hmm. right? So every Every three vector reverses sign. Right? So a force is a vector, right? So force goes to minus F under parity. Right? That's true for any force. In particular, that's true for the Lorentz force. So what happens to the electric field on the parity? Also. Yeah, minus E, minus R. What happened to the magnetic field? Minus B minus R. Mm -hmm. It's a plus. You already have the V here. V cross B. What happened to the Dell operator? The verses. So if I put those in max, the relevant Maxwell's equations, right? So I can write down B equal not block cross A and E plus DA DTA is not block phi.
I think I have a typo in my notes. Then a of r will go to minus a of minus r, and also phi of r will go to minus phi of minus r. Check it. I'm not sure why I wrote plus five, but I think it should be minus five here. So, that means that the four potential, right? So A mu behaves like a vector under parity. It behaves like a three vector under parity. Uh, like a three vector, yeah. Yeah, okay. A. The spatial component. Ah. Uh, the, the vector potential. Yeah. So the vector potential. A. We have like a vector under parity. Uh, transformation. So since this three, this, since this A, right, the vector potential is what defined the photon. Actually, sorry, uh, sorry uh, yeah. I don't, I, I'm not sure I agree with five of R goes to minus five of minus R. You have I, a nabla before five. I'm also, oh, you're right. Actually, yeah, that's why. Uh, so you have- Maybe you're right, I, yeah, maybe you're right. I, I put it down here with, uh, yeah, you're right, I think. And that way, the four vector, the, the four vector of the potential does behave like a vector. Yeah, you're right. Because the time component doesn't change. And you're right. I wrote, it, I wrote it down properly in my lecture notes, but now for some reason I decided that uh, I couldn't see it right away. You're right. Thank you. You're right. Phi would go as minus phi. That's true. That's why that the. Um, the four vector, the, the special part of the four vector would behave like um, a vector under part transformation. Yes, thank you very much for this. Um, okay, since this A mu is what describes the photon, then we say that the photon has an intrinsic parity. Uh, P gamma minus one, which is essentially this uh, intrinsic parity is the the phase factor that arises as uh, the eigenvalue of the of the parity operator. Okay. Another example of a symmetry, which again is crucial symmetry, is called charge conjugation. Let's go briefly over that charge conjugation of the photon. And it's also known as charge parity or charge reversal. Again, this is another important discrete symmetry uh, of symmetry transformation. Uh, we will discuss it. By the way, when you say charge, it's not just the electromagnetic charge, it's all the charges that they carry. Uh, so again, basically the effect of a charge conjugation is to replace the particle with the ionic particle. In fact, 
charge conservation. is to replace a particle with an anti-particle. And vice versa. So on the charge reversal, right row charge right row goes to minus row and j goes to minus j the current so again from the inhomogeneous maxwell's equations in the lorentz condition the lambertian of a nu is j nu we automatically get that a nu goes to minus a nu from which we state that the photon has an eigenvalue of the charge conjugation of c Gamma is minus one. This is the photon eigenvalue under um, oh, not under eigenvalue of the charge conjugation. Now combine together this P gamma equal minus one and C gamma equal minus one is written uh, together in a, in a one compact form notation. They're written as J P C. That's what you find is one minus minus. That's what you find in the literature. All right, let's do a quick summary of what we said about the photon. It's massless. We learn it from P mu, P mu equal to zero. It's a vector, right? Namely, it is described by a four vector, right? Although it has only two degrees of freedom, it is a vector. Right? It is a vector described by a four vector. It has two degrees of freedom. is transverse P dot epsilon equal to zero. It has spin one with helicity plus minus one. And it has this uh, JPC equal one minus minus. So the eigenvalues with respect to parity transformation and, and charge conjugation transformation are both minus ones. These are all intrinsic properties of the photon. As we derived the uh, Again, given the quantum mechanical interpretation uh, to Maxwell's equations. All right. Can I ask a question? Yes, you can. Um, regarding the, the spin and the helicity. Yeah. So it, it, the, the spin of the photon is one, but it's say Z component or whatever could be plus and minus one. Yeah. And that looks like the helicity, but it's not the same, right? I mean, you, could you have a particle? No, so, so what's what's the? 
how am I supposed to think about helicity? Because I mean, yeah. so can I have a spin up and helicity down? How, how does that work? Yeah, you can. Uh, think uh, a photon will always move at the speed of light. So it cannot change the helicity. But uh, if you think of relativistic uh, particles, let's say cosmic rays or protons, right? They would have an, if you're moving from, uh, now you can make a Lorentz transformation in which it will move in one direction as seen by one observer, but we move in the other direction as seen by another observer. So the direction of motion will be reverse, but the spin will not. So here the helicity can change. This means that since you measure helicity with respect to the momentum, the direction of the momentum, mm -hmm. you have to measure spin with respect to some uh, global uh, direction? And because otherwise, you know, if, if it's going this way, now going this way, then I would also, the question is how do I measure spin? What is spin up with respect to what? What is, what is up and down? If it, if not with respect to the, to the motion. You understand what I'm asking? Yeah, I understand. I understand the question. I don't think I have a good answer right now. I'll save it and I'll give you an answer uh, next week. Okay, thanks. Even write it down. Make sure that I don't forget to give you the answer by next week. Yeah, I prefer to wait for next week. I don't want to give you now something which will not be accurate enough. Um, okay, we'll come up with uh, with an answer by, by next uh, Tuesday. Uh, any other questions? Okay, and the rest of time, I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, I'm less happy that you don't have that many questions. It's possible as you just saw that you asked me a question, I don't have a good answer right away, then I'll just check it out. But uh, the fact that most of you do not answer ask questions at this point means that you might be quite confused. Maybe no, but at this point, I'm much less convinced that this is the case. Okay. Okay, guys, some people are very quiet. So I ask you to be slightly less quiet and less sharp. You with me, guys? Yeah? Some are. I'm not sure that everybody is. Yeah? Okay. So let's say a few words about the Klein-Gordon equation. It's sort of, I'm going to do two generalizations of what we just did for the photon. Uh, so the photon is massless, right? Uh, it has zero mass. But we can think of an equation for a massive scalar particle. Uh, so first of all, okay, there are two changes. One is I want to add a mass. So massive, that means that M is greater than zero. And two, right now I want to describe an equation using a scalar function, phi. Remember the photon is a vector, right? So a scalar function does not change under Lorentz transformation, although the argument does change, right? If you're not sure what it is, I mean, think of a temperature. Right. At any location, I, I specify a temperature. The temperature changes from point to point. But it is a scalar function. So one number is enough to describe the temperature at each point in space and time. Right? Uh, now, um, now, since it's a scalar function, right, it's um, uh, invariant under Lorentz transformation. OK. 
right? Because Lorentz transformation uh, leaves scalar invariant. That automatically means, by the way, that Schrodinger's equation can it cannot be used to describe a scalar massive particle. Why not? What's wrong with Schrodinger? It's not relativistic. Non relativistic, that's true. Well, uh, if you look at the structure of the equation, you have a first derivative in time and a second derivative in space. Unless we derived it on Tuesday, well, it didn't derive it really, it just, uh, just uh, sketched it. Right? It goes back to the use of the non relativistic relation between the energy and momentum. Right? E is equal to P square over 2m. Uh, of course, this only holds for the non relativistic uh, case, it does not hold for relativistic. So we want to have basically a relativistic version of Schrodinger's equation, right? Or Schrodinger's equation for relativistic particles. And it's pretty much straightforward. So uh, generalize, derive, derive a relativistic generalization. Schrodinger's equation. I hope you can read my handwriting. It's quite bad, but it's partly because it's me and partly because I'm still getting used to writing down in this electronic uh, form. Uh, right. So for massless particles, what do we have? What do we have for a massless particle? Schrodinger. No, Schrodinger is not for massless particles. We just derived it. What is a massless particle? E equals PC. Right, it's a photon, right? So how, how would I write down an equation for a massless particle, scalar particle? So you would need a first order derivative both in time and in space? Right first. Hmm? What did we just do for the photon? What equation do I use for the photon? In vacuum. The wave equation? What? Wave equation? Right. Right, I can just write down the D'Alembertian of phi is equal to zero. I know it's a solution for a massless particle. Right, but this is a massless, I want to add a mass. Right, so I have P mu, P mu, right? Minus M squared is equal to zero. What do I get? What, what do we get? It's an equation. Impulse equation. Yeah. Or just say the equation. The number Tian plus M squared of phi equals zero or minus. No, plus, plus. Minus. P mu, P minus, mu, minus. minus. Right, but I have also minus m squared, so I can just multiply it. It's zero anyway, so I just multiply it by minus one, and I ended up with an Dalembertian plus m squared of phi is equal to zero. That's called the Klein Gordon equation. It goes back to 1926. Out of curiosity, how many of you have seen Klein Gordon equation before? Okay. Uh, so you must know that uh, 
It's actually derived first by Schrodinger. The same Schrodinger, right? So he actually derived it before he derived the famous Schrodinger's equation. But then he threw it away. Why? It was not. Why did you think it was not good? Well, what's the problem with, uh, if you know it? If you don't know, then okay, I understand. But uh, a few of you said you've seen it before. What's the problem with this equation? I think the problem was that it requires two initial conditions about no. the, the function and the time derivative. No, that's not a problem. It's a general uh, solution for the Helmholtz equation. But what, what is the real problem? You learn it, you, know, you say it, learn it, <laughs> you've seen it, I don't know. I'll try again. Perhaps it wasn't, it didn't recreate the spectrum of the hydrogen. No. no. So Something much more fundamental, problematic here. It gives rise to negative energies, right? Uh, so, you know, if you try, try a plane wave solution, right? Try. A plane wave solution. Right. So put the solution psi, right? Some e plus minus i p mu x mu. Right. Now, right. What do we get from the Klein Gordon equation? We get the minus p mu p mu plus m squared is equal to zero. Right. If you use this solution in the Klein Gordon equation. Inside line border equation, right? So obviously, this is mean that e right is plus minus square root of p squared plus m squared. Okay, so we got the solution of a plane wave and some of these plane waves, half of them exactly have negative energies. It is a problem, right? In classical mechanics, we, we when we encounter such a thing, it's quite straightforward, right? We just say, okay, this is not physical solution. Forget about it and focus on physical. Now in quantum mechanics, we cannot do that, right? Because why not? Why I cannot do the same trick in quantum mechanics? That goes back to quantum mechanics because all solutions must form a complete set, right? So a part of the Hilbert space. So I cannot just uh, ignore one half of the Hilbert space. Again, am I talking gibberish or you follow what I'm saying? Right? In classical physics, we simply say this is not physical. Um, it's more than zero is not a physical solution. And forget about it. Right? In quantum mechanics, right? Uh, all solutions form a complete set. Uh, which is Hilbert space, right? So we cannot simply uh, ignore half of Hilbert space. Let's say we could, we, we would run into an even more severe problem, right? What is that?
What is the even more severe problem that we cannot ignore? See, those of you who said that you've encountered it, it was a long time ago. <laughs> okay. That's the negative probability density. Right? You know, to the of negative probability density. What does it mean, negative probability density? Right. What is the interpretation of the wave function psi in quantum mechanics? What is psi? How, how do I interpret psi? Square root for probability. Right. right. Psi tells me everything there is to know about the, the particle, right? And if I look at the psi, star psi, d cube x, this is really the probability in quantum mechanics. Psi star psi, d cube x is the probability of finding the particle. Uh, which is represented by psi. And within the volume element, d cube x. Right. So I can define the probability density well, don't be confused with the charge density density, right? So I just call it rho of x and t. And see I'm using a bad notation because it's the same notation, right? If this is just psi star of x and t and psi of x and t. Of course, uh, if the particle does not decay, I know it is somewhere in space. So integral of rho over the entire space, what does it give me? One. One, right? It already shows me that this is a, a problematic uh, equation to use because it can only handle single particles and in quantum field theory, I can produce new particles. So number of particles is not conserved. Now, if I'm not looking at the entire space, but I'm looking at just a part of space, right? So if I have this volume and I have some particle probability, then the probability of, you know, the change of probability of this particle in the volume is, is associated with the, you know, flux of particles that go through the boundaries of the volume, right? So I'm ending up with a continuity equation. So if I have a surface S, right? I can look at, I can define the probability current density. J, right, X and T, right? This is the flux of probability across the element of surface. across a surface element. Yes, right, is J dot BS. So the rate of exchange of total probability, right, of finding the particle within this volume V of DV, right? is exactly the net flux of particles leaving it and entering it, right? So dt, integral of the volume rho dv, is minus integral over the surface, j dot ds, is minus, um, using the divergence theorem, right? Now by the j dv.
No, this is the volume element is arbitrary. So we end up with a continuity equation. Double J plus DT rho is equal to zero. Now you're with me? I think you've seen from the, the continuity equation in the past. I hope you did, right? Yeah? Shukai? Yeah? Okay, good. What's, what's that to do with the Klein-Gordon equation? So let's look now at the Klein-Gordon equation. Right, so how do we get the continuity equation? Right, so we take the Klein Gordon equation minus d mu d mu plus m squared pi equal to zero. I multiply that by minus i phi star. I add uh, the complex conjugate. So I add them um, the two terms with the mass cancel. And we end up with uh, I phi star d mu d mu phi minus i phi d mu d mu phi star is equal to zero. Right, but d mu d mu I can simply expand. Right, so this is just dt of i phi star dt phi minus phi dt phi star plus nabla dot minus i phi star nabla phi minus phi nabla phi star is equal to zero. So all we need to do is to identify J mu, right? They just row on J as I phi star D mu phi minus phi D mu phi star. That's the conserved current. In the equation we have here, simply states as d mu j mu is equal to zero. The factor i is just to make sure that what we get is real. The last thing is to look again at plane wave solution. All right, so if I write down phi is some normalization E minus I P mu X mu. Then rho 
right? I have to have phi phi star, right? Bt bt phi. So it's just two times n squared um, p zero. So d over dx zero. It's p zero. So it's just e. And j is two n squared times p. So simply j mu is just two n squared uh, p mu. So this probability density is just proportional to the energy. Right, so rho Rho is proportional to E. Right? So for P zero, which is E is more than zero, we automatically get the J zero, which is rho is more than zero. So if we have a negative energy solution that automatically gives us negative uh, probability of finding the particle within a volume element. So that's why, although Schrodinger was the first to derive it, as far as I know, he abandoned it because it was pretty much thought that this is not physical. It cannot really describe a particle. No, that was true until 1934. What happened in 1934? Dirac? No, Dirac is something else. It happened actually quite earlier in 31 or 32. 34 was the discovery of the antiparticle, right? Now, anti, anti Dirac will describe something else. We'll describe the electrons, the spin half particles, basically. This we also describe the anti-electron. What? Dirac will describe, will describe fermions and will describe also anti-fermions. We'll discuss Dirac uh, starting next week. Uh, so that gave a new interpretation, which goes back to Pauli and Weisskopf, which says that uh, many, maybe we simply have to add a charge into the definition here, right? So it's a, you know, if I take the racket, it's not a non-physical example, right? So Pauli and Weisskopf, a little bit of time, Weisskopf argued that one can maybe introduce the charge. Right. So for non-physical example, right, if it was the electron, you could argue that J mu electron is minus uh, the electron charge times two n squared P mu. It's not physical because electron is a spin half fermion and this is described by Dirac equation. It would not be described by the clan gordon equation anyway. It's not a scalar, right? So rather than probability current, it will be a charge current. And charge current, as we know, can be negative. Right? Now Feynman took it one step further, right? If you go, if you go one step further, that's Feynman uh, Stuckelberg, uh, which extended that and say, okay, uh, we can think of the probability current of a positron with having an energy momentum P mu, right? So J mu, so let's go back to Feynman. That goes to Feynman and Stuckelberg, right? Look at J mu of the positron, it would work plus E times two n squared P mu, right? That's the same, what is that really? This is the same as the probability current of an electron with the same energy and the same momentum, but negative. Right, so this is J mu 
minus e minus, right? This will be a minus e times two n squared times minus p mu. And so the way Feynman interpreted it is saying, okay, so we have an emission of a positron with energy E is really identical to absorption of an electron with an energy minus E, right? What's the, what's the relation between the processes? It's a time reversal, it goes back in time. Right, so negative energy particle solution, such as negative energy electron, right, or positron, which goes backward in time, describes a positive energy antiparticle, which goes forward in time. So it's one, when we put the Feynman diagram, we reverse the order of the arrows. So a positron, it's a positive energy is identical to an electron with a negative energy. But that's just an interpretation. Right? That's, that's how it became like that. that. That's how it got into Feynman diagram. Right? It's just interpretation is of course related to the fact that e minus e uh, t is just e minus e minus e minus t. That's where it comes from. Negative energy going backward in time is like a positive energy that goes forward in time. Okay, now uh, there is something which is really deep here. It goes down to the CPT uh, theorem, right? CPT is a uh, charge parity and then and time. Uh, we will discuss this theorem because it's fundamental in understanding why we're made of particles and not of antiparticles. Uh, okay, I went a little bit into philosophy. Bottom line, the Schrodinger and the klein gordon good enough equations, uh, not just because of that, but because they can only describe single particles. And uh, uh, that means that they do not allow the possibility of new particles to create or annihilate, create or destroy. And we know that this happens in nature, when we're seeing that. Um, so we cannot really describe, cannot really use uh, any equation is only good for describing a single particle to describe what happens in nature. Um, okay. Uh, when you learn properly quantum field theory, you'll see that there is very elegant, there are very elegant solutions to this problem. So it is a solvable issue, but that's part of the reason why klein gordon equation is not a good equation anyway. Okay, I went, I ran out of time. Any questions? Okay, we're getting somewhat technical. If it gets too much, then let me know. The, the idea is to make this course accessible for everybody, including uh, you know, uh, undergraduates. You don't have to be a master student to be able to, to master what happens here. Uh, um, review the material. I'm not giving you now any homework. I want to start uh, maybe possibly put some more exercises at a somewhat simpler level, maybe. I'm not sure. Well, it is actually quite simple, but possibly to get more uh, more exercise in some parts that I think uh, might be useful. Um, okay, review these things. I also posted, as you might have seen, I posted uh, some of my lecture notes on the website. I finally had some time to go over and clean it up a little bit. Um, you can have a look. It's a personal, uh, treat it as personal and confidential, basically. Uh, that's it for now. I owe you an answer, a better answer about the helicity. I'll, I'll think of that a little bit um, and return to you on Tuesday.
And on Tuesday, we'll complete that. We still, I still want to discuss Broca equation that takes another 10, 15 minutes. Um, that's relevant for massive, sorry, yeah, right. Um, for, for, for massive particles, um, which are vectorial, not just the scalars, such as in Klein Gordon. And that is actually relevant for what we're seeing in uh, uh, standard models, especially for the W and Z bosons. So we'll discuss that on Tuesday. And then I want to do some exercise playing a little bit more in-depth into this uh, uh, parity and charge uh, uh, symmetries. Questions? No? Okay, guys, have a great weekend. Um, so I have a question that is not directly related. It is vaguely related to what you said, to what you mentioned earlier. Try um, me. It's not directly related to, to the subject you talked about for the last 30 minutes. Yeah. As an example for, scal for scalar, you mentioned uh, temperature. Yeah. Now, temperature is a scalar in the terms that it has only one component. Yeah. But actually, I would expect it to behave like energy, which is not a Lorentz scalar. It's not invariant. Because temperature is essentially energy in the microscopic scale. I gave the temperature. Yeah, you're right. Well, so, temperature is defined. OK. OK. Temperature, you know, you cannot define a temperature in space because there are not enough particles, right? Temperature, when, you, when I say temperature, when, when you say temperature, there is a lot of things behind that, right? You say that you know that there is a distribution which can be described by a Maxwellian distribution of particles. Yes. Right? If you don't have enough particles that they form a Maxwellian distribution, then the word temperature is meaningless. Yes, you need a system. You need a large yes, system. I gave it, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, I fully agree with that. I gave it as an example. You know, sometimes people find it more difficult to visualize the differences between a scalar field and a vectorial field. Right. I mean, we. I, I just gave you as a, as an example of um, of a quantity, which is a field. So that means that every position in space and time, every point in space and time that I choose in this room or in your room or anywhere in space, okay, on Earth, on the surface of Earth, I can. It gets a value, and this value changes from point to point, and can change in time. At the same point, it can change in time, but it's a single value. Okay. As opposed to, for example, an electric field yes. or a magnetic field or any other field, which is a vectorial field, which is a vector. I can measure what is the electric field here in this point in my room, and this will give me a vectorial quantity. Of course, this is still a field in the sense that it is, it is defined in every point in space and time, right? I can. It can, I can have one electric field here, and if I wait five minutes, it can be a different field. Or if I go here, it will be a different field. But it's still a, a, a and it's not a, a single, a single number cannot, cannot describe it because it's a vectorial quantity. I need to describe it as a vector. Yes. As opposed to temperature in which a single number is sufficient to yes. describe it. That's all. Now you're right that. If you go to the exact uh, physical definition of a temperature, yes, temperature is only defined when you have a Maxwellian distribution of particles, which you're right. So, in, in deep space, this is this is meaningless. So to to clearly say it, you you meant a scalar as a single number, not as a Lorentzian, not as a Lorentzian scalar. It essentially would be the same, but but yeah, I mean, what I mean by a no, scalar is, is no, a quantity. I, I yes, it will. It, 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 no, is a, it is a quantity that that transforms like a scalar under Lorentz transformation. Okay, no, because because a single number is is less is more general than the, than that than that. Energy density is is a single number, but but it's not a Lorentz scalar. Right, energy. it runs from energy density is not a scalar. You're right. It is. Okay. It is. So a, you mean a scalar like a zero component of a four vector? Yes. So you mean a scalar by the strict definition of something that does not change under Lorentz? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Scalar for me is something that does not change when you make a Lorentz transformation. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. All right.
Thank you. Goodbye. Oh, thank you very much. Gonna stop sharing and uh, stop recording.